So we finish up today the series that we've been looking at, Cultivate. So we've been looking at how we can cultivate different aspects or different parts of our faith journey and how we can grow stronger in our relationship with God. We've been looking at a deeper dive into our missional mandate as a local church. A mandate to connect people to Jesus by reviving faith, restoring hope, and revealing love in the community. And two parts of our motives, or not our motives, but two parts of our life marks, if you will. When we look at what we're doing in the church characteristics that we can look at people in the church and saying if if these things are present then we can see ourselves being successful today we look at two of them and the first one is ownership ownership I, some of you may be thinking does he mean actually member membership um, because membership would make more sense, right, when we're talking about church. Um, no, I'm not talking uh, about membership. Because membership actually communicates something totally different than what it was originally meant to communicate, especially in today's society. When we think about our membership to, well, not the why anymore, um, when we think about our membership to any organization or we think about the rights that we now have because we've paid our dues, right? We've, we've paid what is required of us and so therefore we are entitled to these rights. But really, membership is not about what we're entitled to. Membership is actually supposed to be about a commitment to a deeper understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ. It's a call to action. It's, it's a call to deeper devotion. It's a call to committing to a local church. But ownership, ownership in serving and giving and leading, engaging in worship, engaging in discipleship, Ownership is about responsibilities. Because as owners, how many of you own your home or are purchasing your home? One of the things that I've discovered as I have had conversations with people is the differences in mentality that people have simply when they have something like, let's, Take, for example, like living in a home. The mindset that a person has when they rent that home versus the mindset a person has when they own that home. What I've discovered is that people tend to care more about the things that are theirs than the things that belong to someone else. We have that mentality that if it's ours, it's no one else's responsibility to take care of it. It's our responsibility. I remember having a conversation with someone one time. It was someone I knew so I could be blunt with them, and I asked them, so why don't you take care of your property? Well, why don't you, like, mow more than, like, once a month? And... Why don't you, you know, use that weed eater that's in the box in your garage? He's like, I don't need to. I don't care. I'm like, why don't you care? Like, you're not renting the house. This is your house. You live here, and, like, you, you're owning it. He's like, I don't pay for it. I'm like, oh. His wife's dad paid the down payment. He pays a small portion of the monthly mortgage and the dad pays the rest. Oh. So there's no ownership involved in this. So you don't have anything invested and so therefore, why do I need to maintain what's not mine? 
It's interesting how we think differently if it's ours versus someone else's. When we think about Thomas in the Gospels, we don't hear a lot about Thomas, but what we do hear, we're not too sure he's the greatest example of a disciple or a follower of Jesus. You know, the few things that we know about Thomas is that he didn't take the disciples at their word. Jesus had lived with the disciples for three and a half years before he was crucified, and then he rose from the dead, and he appeared to the disciples, but the first time he appeared, Thomas wasn't with them. So the disciples tell Thomas about Jesus and that he had appeared to them. And, and Thomas's response is, I don't believe you until I can put my fingers in the nails in his hands, the nail marks in his hands, and until I can touch the wound in his side. Then I will believe. So we typically look at Thomas and we say that he doubted. That as followers of Jesus, that's the worst thing you can do. Like if we're going to rank the disciples in worst case scenario, Judas is at the top and then Thomas is a very close second. Because he doubted that Jesus did what he said he was going to do. But you know, I think there's another side to Thomas. You see, I think Thomas's doubt was actually a catalyst for him. It was a catalyst for a pure search for something more, for something deeper. His doubt came from his desire to know Jesus for himself, not from a desire to leave or, or disbelieve in Jesus, I don't think Thomas wanted to leave his faith at all. If this was the case, if Thomas really wanted to leave his faith, then he would have never spread the gospel throughout India. He would have never been martyred for his faith or killed for his faith and his teaching of Jesus. You just don't do that. You don't do those things. It wasn't that he was trying to find or leave who Jesus was or to not believe. I think Thomas was a tender-hearted man who was protecting his heart from being broken again. You see, there were other messiahs, if you will, that had come before Jesus. Other people who had claimed that they were the messiah. They would gather their disciples or their followers and, and they would go into battle and they would fight the Roman oppressors. But then the one who claimed to be the Messiah would be killed in battle and the disciples would disperse and you wouldn't hear about them anymore. This happened multiple times. And now the one that Thomas had followed, had been killed too. He watched him die on a cross. He watched him be put in the grave. Do we really blame him for having some doubt? Thomas doubted. Yet he didn't just settle for what other people told him. He wanted to see it for himself. One of my greatest desires as a pastor is for more of his followers to have a passion to see for themselves. what you learn about God's word would not be what you hear from the pastor. But you would challenge it. 
that you would go home and that you would read the word for yourself. That you wouldn't just take what I say as being gospel. But that you would seek to learn it for you. One of the things that I know about faith is that there are going to be times when you have to stand on the faith of others. Where your faith isn't strong enough and you need other people's faith. You need to borrow it for a little bit to help hold you up until you're strong enough to stand on your own. In John, the Gospel of John, Jesus comes and he he doesn't go around Samaria, but he goes through Samaria and he goes to Jacob's well and he has an encounter with this woman. And he sits down and and he has this conversation with this woman. He tells her uh, about her sin and her life. He reveals himself as the Messiah to her. And she comes to believe that he is the Messiah. And she goes back and she tells all the people in Samaria about this Jesus, about this Messiah who who knew so much about her. Yet he loved her anyway. And then it says in verse 42, because Jesus stayed And he taught the people in Samaria. In chapter 4, verse 42, it says, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Until they had heard it for themselves, they had to stand on the faith of the Samaritan woman. They needed her faith to get them to the point where they could hear it for themselves. But an important part of this that we need to understand and we need to not forget is that there will come a time when you have to own your faith. When you have to be the owner of your own faith. I will challenge you. I'll push back. I'll frustrate you at times. You might feel like I'm bugging you from time to time. But I won't force you. And the reality is I can't force you. I'll be honest. When, when I don't see people for a, a few weeks, I start to get down about it. I start to think, you know, where are they? Why aren't they here? Why aren't they in a life group? Why aren't they getting involved more? And I start to take it personally. But then I get over that because it's not about me. I don't want you to come because... The pastor guilted you into it. I want you to own your faith. I want you to be here because you want to be here. I want you to be here because there's no other place you would rather be. That you value your faith so much that your kids' sports games can wait. That the football game, that playing in London, it can be recorded. I want you to own your faith so that when your children see you, they can own their faith. Growing up, one of the things I never asked because I knew the answer to As I got older, it became a point where they started scheduling games on Sundays. 
I knew I wasn't going. I knew where I was going to be Sunday morning. It wasn't an option. I never asked because I knew I was going to church. Did I like it? Nope. I loved baseball. I'd much rather be playing baseball. Give me a break. I grew up Catholic. I got a nap in a lot, but... But you know what? I'm thankful that my parents taught me that. Because the deeper message that my parents taught me was, I don't care if you like me right now. What I care about is being the example that God is more important than a baseball game. God is more important to have a relationship with than you making it as the starting pitcher because you missed a game. You see, I think it's so important that we own our faith. And for our children, there comes a point where we have to own their faith for them. So that when they grow up and they leave the house, they can become their owners of their faith. but we also have to give them room to own their faith. You know, I think it's important that when kids go off to college, we don't call them up every Sunday. Were you in church today? Let them figure out that it's important for them to be there. Give them time to fail. I had a young leader that was under my leadership and, and I was you know, trying to, to help them. And so I went to my brother-in-law who's been in ministry a lot longer than I have. He's been in ministry almost 20 some years now. And I called him up, I'm like, what in the world do I do? This, he doesn't listen. And he said, you need to let him fail. You need to give him room to fail. We need to give our kids room to learn. And sometimes the best learning they can do is to fall flat on their face and fail. Because at a certain point, they have to own their faith. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Taking the time to examine yourself and be honest with yourself. If your faith isn't where you feel like it should be, ask yourself the hard question, why isn't it? And then the next question should be, what do I need to do to get it to be where it needs to be? James 2.17, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith that says, I believe in God, but does not live a life that reveals that same belief is not faith at all. It's simply acknowledging the presence of reality. But not doing anything about it. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 6, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Let me just stop right there. Do you, do you hear the depth of that? Blessed are those who thirst hunger and thirst guess what you cannot survive without doing eating or drinking so the very thing that sustains your life that's how deep this is going here blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness righteousness right relationship with God a righteousness 
they will be filled. A hunger and a thirst that our souls crave will be filled. But ownership goes beyond just faith. I say just faith. That's the most important one. But ownership goes beyond that. Ownership also applies to your job. Owning your job, your responsibilities. You see, I, I was, I'm really good about saying, you know, well, that's not my job. Well, is it my job? You know, do we own our jobs? Do we find ourselves doing the bare minimum that we have to do just to pass the day so that we can punch the clock and get out and go home? Or do we show the people around us that we're going to put our best effort into everything that we do? If your job is to take papers from somebody else's desk and file them in a filing cabinet, be the fastest one. Be the most efficient filer. I had a job that I hated. Reading gas meters. If you have a gas meter in your yard, I've probably been in it. Didn't know you at the time, but I've probably been in your yard. It was monotonous. Walk a lot and read a meter and go on. Get chased by dogs, get in my car, get out of my car, freeze my butt off, get back out of the car. Like, it was, I hated it. So it became a game to me. I want to be the first one done. Then I became the first one done. Okay, I want to be the most accurate and the fastest one. So I wanted to have the most, or the least amount of errors, and I wanted to get done the fastest. When I would go and I would help other, um, other people and I would read their route if they were on vacation or something, it would always tell us the last like, amount of time. It would tell us, like, it should take you seven hours to do this route. <laughs> yeah, right. My goal was to beat it. So that when they read it the next month, they were like, Ugh. not even close. I wanted to own it. Do we own our jobs? Do we own our role as a parent or a grandparent? Do we own our part in the church? Do we own our part in the community? This is a big one. This is an important one for me. You see, one of the reasons, I just had this epiphany not too long ago. I was mowing my yard and for whatever reason, I usually typically love doing yard work, but I was not liking having to do it in that moment. And then God used that moment and revealed to me why I mow my yard. Sounds kind of petty, right? Why I mow my yard. But then I realized, because I look at my neighbor who doesn't mow his yard, has never used a weed eater on his yard, and I realized, you know, his care for his property affects me. Because the way his property looks affects my property value. And then I realized, oh wait. So I have this asset, I have this thing that is my responsibility to take care of, but it doesn't just affect me. It doesn't just affect my family. It affects my neighborhood. It teaches something about me and my family to the people who come into my neighborhood. Does this person care for their property? Does this person respect me by caring for their property? Yesterday, Samantha and Ariana owned their neighborhood. 
we have a small little tree in our front yard. It's so small that the, uh, it's a kind of a tree that the leaves fall like early, early in fall. So they're out of the way. But our neighbors have a pretty good sized tree in their front yard and, and they just sit there. So I went out the front yard yesterday to put like two little things of lights. <laughs> I love those things. It makes decorating a whole lot faster. Just put those little like laser things in your front yard and you're done. I love it. So that was my agenda. All of a sudden, the two rakes that are in the garage are missing. And the girls are raking the neighbor's yard. Didn't say a thing to them. Jennifer looks at me and is like, you have another rake so we can speed this up. Next thing we know, all four of us are in the neighbor's front yard raking their leaves. They didn't come out and thank us. I don't even know if they were home, but they, they didn't say anything to us. But you know, we, that's not why we did it. Jennifer and I did it because we were being given an example by our you know, 10 and 7 year old who were owning their neighborhood. Ariana kept saying, they're going to like us now. I'm like, well, they already like us. She's like, they're going to like us more. I'm like, yep, they are. The last thing, equipped. Are people equipped for ministry? Do people in the church have the tools that they need to grow in their faith? Are they given opportunities to, to do things beyond just Sunday morning worship? Because I've said a million times, and I'll say it a million more times before I die, um, hopefully, it, that is, you can learn something in Sunday morning from a message, but you grow in a group. You grow in community. You grow by being involved in people's lives. Are we giving you opportunities to be involved in those things? To grow in your faith? To grow, you know, are we equipping you as a disciple? Are we equipping you to serve in ministry and in the community? Are we discipling, which I believe we're falling short in this area, and it's an area that we're working towards, are we discipling you to be disciples who disciple other people? I know some of you just broke out in a sweat when you heard that. But are we equipping you to be able to disciple another person, to help them grow in their faith? Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13, Paul says this, so Christ gave himself, gave, sorry, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, and the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The full measure of the fullness of Christ is not accomplished if people are not equipped in the body of Christ. Just as much as my role as your pastor is to equip you, we also need to understand that what you are experiencing in your life right now and what you have experienced in your life is God equipping you for what you will soon be facing? God also equips you to face what is ahead. You may be asking yourself, why am I going through this pain? And why am I going through these struggles in my life right now? God is equipping you to be able to handle what's ahead. I'm going to be a little uncomfortable with myself right now. Had I not been equipped prior 
to two weeks ago, I probably would have walked away from ministry. I don't know what it was. But when I was recovering from my surgery, I didn't want to write a message. I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to come back to an office and have to do reports. I didn't want to have to prepare for another board meeting. I didn't. I can't tell you why. I don't know why. But I was it's just like, I wasn't even at the point where I could process and say, you know what, I just, I'm tired. But you know, when I thought about it, I just sum it up to being I was weak. Physically. And when you're weak physically, Satan is going to use every opportunity he can to bring you down. But because of all the things that have gone on in my life, I just simply said, you know what? I believe this is what God's called me to do. I love doing it. And I'm not going to let Satan win. I'm not going to let him win in my life. And it was because of the things that I've gone through in my life that I realized I've gone through a lot harder stuff than this. This is nothing. What am I, why am I struggling with this right now? But then I came across this scripture in 1 Thessalonians 1. Verses 2 and 3, it says, Paul writes this, he says, We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope. Inspired by hope. Um, Too many things have happened lately that I gotta talk to. I just read a thing this morning on Facebook someone that many of the people here in the church know, posted on Facebook a sign that they had seen in front of a church. This person particularly struggles with depression. And this sign on the front of this church said, we are too blessed to be depressed. And I wrote to him as a pastor, and I apologized. I promise you, you'll never see that crap on our sign. And the guy goes on to say, you know what? I struggle with depression, but I've never been at a place where I've been so depressed that I didn't realize that I was blessed. But it doesn't mean I'm no less depressed. Almost to insinuate that why are you depressed? God died for you. Get over it, right? No. But then Jennifer and I are watching a show last night. Believe it or not, the best line I've ever heard, and I'll admit it, I watched a Hallmark movie. Thank you. My name is Dustin. Welcome to, you know, Hallmark Anonymous. But a guy made this comment. He said that his wife used to say this. He said that hope is found standing in the darkness, 
looking out into the light. We find our hope in the midst of darkest times. But we find hope when we look out and we look up into the light. And it says your endurance, inspired by hope, your endurance of being in the darkness, walking through the trials and the struggles of life, and being able to look out and know that there is hope, that there is light, that God's presence is found not just in the light, but God's light is found in that darkness inside of each one of us. But you know, I believe that the person who wrote that comment on Facebook this morning, they were able to come to the point of making those comments and admitting to the world, the social media world, that he admits with depression. Most people don't want to admit it because they see it as a weakness and, and, you know, they're looked down upon. But you know what? It's because of what he's gone through in life. It's because his faith has been equipped in his life and God has worked in his life that he's able to come to a place and say, you know what, I, I'm depressed, but praise God, I know I'm still blessed. But that doesn't mean I'm no less depressed. And I want to be a part of equipping you to be able to grow in your faith, to grow as leaders in the community so that we can be who God created us to be. So when those trials and those temptations and those struggles come, that you're able to stand confident in them and saying, this is who I am. And it doesn't matter what Satan tries to tell me otherwise.